So I want to welcome everybody to um, this season's first Garner Smarter, Deterring Deers. Um, our next presentation is going to be on February 13th. Um, please register. Um, it's called Growing Three Crops in a Single Year. Um, this is um, a program um, from the University of Maryland's um, Master Garners, as well as the help of the Calvert Library. And both programs are in hope of empowering individuals to lifelong learning. Um, the Master Garner program is supported um, by the University of Maryland's Extension, and our mission is to educate residents about safe and effective and sustainable horticultural practices that build healthy gardens, landscapes, and communities. And if you're ready, Mariah, um, you are ready to go. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that was a really good introduction. Thank you. Um, so, uh, well, today we're going to talk about deterring deer in your gardens and ways to kind of outsmart the deer. Um, but a little background, a little further information about the Master Gardener program. So we fall under the University of Maryland Extension, which is under the University of Maryland Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, we're like an extension of them. So our goal is to really educate people at the county level um, instead of just at the university level, uh, but we are a part of Maryland. Um, and we have a lot of different uh, like sub programs within the Master Gardener program. We have Ask a Master Gardener plant clinics. We can ask us plant questions. Uh, we have the Grow It Eat It program, which teaches you to think, grow and then eat your own food. We have the Baywise program, which teaches you how to garden and landscape in ways that are friendly to the Chesapeake Bay, or at least not as harmful as some other methods. Uh, we do uh, composting and native plants. So we have a lot of information for everyone and the Garden Smarters are a really great way to cover all of these topics, uh, to teach everyone more about all of these and more. Um, so just kind of jumping into the topic for today. Um, go, first, I'm going to go over a little bit about just like deer biology, um, how to find out if what you're seeing in your garden is deer damage or some other set type of damage, uh, go over deer resistant plants, some ways that you can deter deer in your garden, um, and then I uh, wish you all a happy Saturday. <laughs> um, so first, a uh, little background about deer. Um, in Maryland, we only have one species, which is the white-tailed deer or Otocolius virginianus. Um, their characteristics are like these white tails, which when predators see that, they know that the deer is already gone. Um, it's like the predators might as well throw in the white towel um, is the deer are pretty quick. Um, usually the little fawns are born in um, the spring between like April and July with most of them being born in June. Uh, most of the time female deer or you know they does have one to two uh, baby deer and when they're young they get these they have these little white spots on them for about the first year or two. Um, and then, of course, the males have the big antlers. Um, White-tailed deer are actually the most widely distributed undulate in North America. Um, and undulate means just like hooved mammal, um, like horses and uh, mountain goats and uh, animals like that are also uh, undulates. Um, and you can see their population is not only in the continental United States, it also goes up into Canada, Central America, and South America. So they are all over. They've been introduced in other parts of the world, like New Zealand, um, 
they are really all over. Uh, we have a pretty strong population here in Maryland. Um, our neighbors to the north, Pennsylvania, have an even stronger population of deer. Um, and Mississippi has a particularly uh, large population density of deer. Um, so, but you may notice that they're not really over in California, um, in this part of the country, because there's not as much good cover there for them. Um, and probably some reasons like over hunting. Uh, deer were, like everything, hunted quite a bit in the early uh, 20th century, the 1900s. Um, but there's been some restrictions on hunting, so their population has boomed. Uh, natural predators were white wolves and coyotes, and, but those have largely been eradicated in many parts of the country, including Maryland. Um, so they've, they've kind of gone a little bit unchecked um, and their population has just been booming. So they kind of can be a little bit of a nuisance in gardens and definitely highways. Um, so if you want to keep them out of their, your garden, I'm going to give you a couple tips and tricks. A um, little more about deer biology, because uh, it helps to know like when they're most active, like what they eat and that sort of thing. Um, so deer are crepuscular, so they're most active at dawn and dusk. Um, and they're like, kind of a little bit nocturnal as well. Uh, you know, nocturnal means like they're up during the night, diurnal means during the day, and crepuscular is like they wake up and then uh, you get some breakfast, then I guess they take a nap during the day, <laughs> then they're awake for dinner, and they might have a late dinner sometimes and stay up a little bit, but then they usually kind of calm down in like the middle of the night, like early morning. Um, and their diet consists of browse, which is the leafy parts of woody plants, so like tree leaves, um, shrub leaves, forbs, which is herbaceous broadleaf plants, including agricultural crops like beans, uh, hard and soft mass like seeds, uh, acorns are a favorite. And then they're really not that big on grass. Deer have a very fast metabolism and uh, a strong one and they actually have enzymes in their mouth that can help them break down like more fibrous material um, like acorn and tannins. So deer can eat an amount of acorns that would actually kill a cow. Um, cows digestive systems are a lot different. So like cows and horses uh, do well with like long grass like hay. Deer need the more leafy stuff with higher nutrients because of the way their digestive system is. So they don't typically eat a lot of grass, um, but they do eat some. And they've also been known to eat mushrooms and lichens. Um, and this information is from Mississippi State. Like I mentioned, Mississippi has a very large deer population. So they have, their university has like a deer ecology lab where they just study deer. Um, and uh, most of the deer's diet is browse, forbs, and a little bit of mass, uh, but it's mostly browse and forbs, like upwards of 85% of their diet is just like leaves and herbaceous plants, basically. Um, and I, I just like that picture. I thought the deer looked kind of happy, and a little goofy, he just, he's just eating some leaves. He's, Chilling, that's what he does. Um, okay, so deer are creatures of habit. They have some pretty predictable cycles, like they mate in the fall, they give birth in the spring, early summer, um, and they are most likely to go into home landscapes or places that you wouldn't normally see them, I guess, in like winter and early spring when like broadleafed uh, plants are more scarce out in the wild. Um, so they'll come into your yard because they're basically starving or pushing that. They're really hungry and they're like, hey, they have this really nice pasta. I'm going to go 
eat that because I'm hungry. Um, and in the early spring, they also eat uh, like newly growing leaves. It's very tender. They like that. Um, and some other reasons that they may go into your yard in a time where it isn't winter and everything's frozen um, or anything like that is when there's drought because uh, that can affect plant growth. Um, and also deer can get a lot of nutrients from or a lot of water moisture from like juicy leaves. So they try to get a little more um, leaves when there's a strong population density, so when there's more deer, that usually means less food for all those deer. So then that's when they have to go out of their more normal uh, feeding areas and seek other food, like food in your yard. Uh, weather conditions, so like I mentioned, like snow, uh, things are frozen. Um, maybe there's a storm or something, I, I don't know. Um, and availability of other food, which kind of ties into the seasonal aspect of it all. Um, it's best to deter deer, like, before they even know your yard is on the map, or like when you first notice them. Because if they, like, in my head, I'm just kind of like laughing. I'm like, well, they must have like a little deer Yelp where they just like write reviews of people's yards and like, oh, this spot's great. And then next thing you know, there's just a bunch of deer. Um, but if they establish your yard as like a feeding spot, they'll add it to like their, it, like their trail system basically. Um, and you want to prevent that from happening. So kind of, um, so first things is kind of like notice some signs, like one major sign is if you see deer tracks around your uh, like property, um, that is sign of deer. Uh, deer tracks look like this, um, just the way they walk. And they're about two and three quarters inches long and two inches across um, at the top. And then they're a little wider at the bottom. And this is um, a picture of a deer track uh, from a Texas 4-H site, um, as is this diagram here, or drawing. Um, it just kind of shows you what to look for. Um, the Texas 4-H site also had like pictures of wild hog tracks, which we don't really have here in Maryland. Um, so most of the time, if you see like the characteristic two toes, that's a deer. Um, and you get really good at it. You can tell how many there are and when they were there most recent. Um, but that's a whole, that's a whole skill. Um, let's see. Oopsie. Okay. And more about telling if it's actually deer or not. Um, so sometimes you might have like, like your plants are damaged. You're like, what's wrong with my plants? Like, I don't know. Um, so the first step before deterring for deer or any other animal or insect or disease is to really determine what it is. Um, other wildlife can cause damage in yards. Sometimes it can be a little hard to tell, but once you get to know what you're looking for, it becomes very easy. Uh, so deer damage, one easy way to tell if it's deer damage or another type of animal damage, like some animals, like if you have vegetable problems, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> cause so many animals eat your vegetables. Um, but deer damage is pretty characteristic because the height difference. Most like groundhogs and rabbits that'll eat your vegetables or leafy greens or whatever, they're gonna be low to the ground. Deer, as you can see on this picture to the bottom right, will browse up to like six foot because they're they're bigger than rabbits and groundhogs. So they browse higher. Um, and they also do this characteristic thing where they'll basically just like prune the bottom of a plant like up to where their head can reach basically. So if you see some damage like this bottom right picture, um, and this 
is a pretty tall shrub. You can see there's a, it's probably the standard like four foot chain link fence behind it. Um, so you can see that's a tall shrub, but the, it's like a characteristic thing where it's just the bottom of the shrub is leafless and the top still has leaves and you're just like, what is causing this? It's, that's a sign that it's probably deer um, or symptom if we're talking IPM here. Uh, and so deer also don't have upper incisors. So they don't like bite, they like bite, but it's more like they bite and tear. They don't make clean cuts. Um, they just kind of like nibble and pull. Um, so if you see some damage like this stick, like see how it's not a clear cut, it's kind of like jagged. That's usually a sign that whatever is causing damage to your plants is a deer. Um, same with these hostas, like the edges are kind of jaggedy. Um, the leaves aren't real evenly. Um, you know, that's kind of, eh. um, but if it, it looks real jaggedy, that's, that's a sign that, symptom that it's a deer. Um, and then another thing is deer, male deer um, do this thing called rubbing. So on their antlers, um, in like the spring, when their antlers are growing, they get this velvet on them, which helps nourish the antlers. But then in like late fall and through winter, like their, their antlers are done growing. And um, so they do this thing where they're trying to just rub it probably like really irritating to them. So they'll use like saplings, like one to two inches, and they'll just rub their antlers, like trying to get the velvet off. Um, so if you see rubbing, that's another sign, symptom that you have deer. Um, and you can protect saplings by putting like some sort of protective wire or um, like a plastic wrap around your trees because they can cause some damage. Um, to little saplings, they can like kind of topple them over a little bit and it can hurt the tree because it removes the bark a lot. So if you notice that, try to protect your trees. Um, I didn't really go into much about protecting trees from rubbing in the rest of my presentation. So it's just, yeah, just try to wrap them. They sell different things you can use to wrap the trunks. Um, and so, I know this slide, the pictures look a little bit funny, but I tried to like put the one, put pictures that were of like, I'm trying to think how to word it, like species damage right next to each other. Um, so there's some that are like together and then some that are just kind of apart. Um, so first is rabbits and rodents up top. So if you look at this compared to, I'm gonna go back, um, that, like that's jagged, this is neat. Like that looks like someone went over there and pruned it, but it was a rabbit that pruned it because they chew very neatly, usually at a 45 degree angle. Um, same with greens. Uh, plant here, um, you can see it's neatly cut. Um, so that's, that's a sign of rabbit damage. Rabbit damage will also be a lot lower and you can often sometimes also tell like what's eating what by what they're eating. Rabbits really like uh, like lettuce and leafy greens, whereas deer tend to go more so for um, like trees and stuff like that, but they will still eat your vegetable crops like beans and things like that. Um, groundhogs also love their vegetables <laughs> um, and they, this is a picture from the Home and Garden Information Center on uh, a groundhog that ate some Brussels sprouts. <laughs> um, and they, they're a rodent, so they'll often leave bite marks like, oops, like rabbits do. But they'll kind of like chew the sides and stuff. Like they're just a mess. Like what are they doing? <laughs> And they'll also like eat like half your tomato. They love tomatoes. Um, I had a couple years ago, I had a garden and I had like 
squash plants and I love those little squash plants and I was getting so frustrated because um, I kept noticing like leaves would be growing and be beautiful and then all of a sudden they would disappear. So one other way you can kind of tell what's what is to like do a stakeout of your garden because if you can see the animal that's another really good way to tell what's causing the damage to your plants. So I like would like wake up all early and just stand by my window with coffee and just like watch my squash plants. And um, I'd be there in the evenings. I was like, most animals that are gonna be eating this are gonna be most active at dawn or dusk. So I'm doing a stakeout to try to protect my squash plants. And eventually um, I did see a little groundhog just kind of like walking up this hill uh, in the backyard and then watched uh, the groundhog go right to my squash. And I went outside, I was like, hey, get away, <laughs> get away from my squash. Um, so like usually if you can see it, that's another really good sign. Um, some people might go all out and set up like wildlife cameras. Um, that's an option. I, I like just watching. It's fun to watch the birds while you're doing that too. Um, so some other damage that you might see or might be a little bit harder to see um, depending on like where the damage is occurring and when. So voles are hard to see because well they, you know, they, they don't really burrow deep in the ground. They kind of stay near the surface. Um, but you can usually see their damage. And voles are different than moles. Uh, voles eat vegetables and are rodent, whereas moles are actually insectivores and they're more closely related to bats than to like mice. Like voles are more closely related to mice. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of diets and like what they do. Moles will burrow underground, um, but they're going after the grubs. Uh, whereas voles will, they eat plant material, so they'll eat a lot of roots. They'll chew uh, like the bottom of trees and stuff. So those are something to keep out for if you see like teeth mark or bark missing near the bottom of a tree or these weird little holes and then grass missing, that's a sign of voles. Moles um, kind of be like more like raised tunnels. Um, and like moles, uh, skunks will also go after grubs in your yard. So if you see just a bunch of like pieces of grass all around your yard and you're like, what happened? Like, did a deer come like dig up my yard? What? It's probably, a, it could be a skunk. Um, they will just tear up grass looking for grubs. Um, and raccoons tend to go more after vegetables. They can be a problem um, in cornfields. Like, they're pretty smart. I gotta give it to them. <laughs> um, they'll like corn peel parts of a corn husk back and then like eat like half the corn and then just like move on to the next. Like, what? Uh, but so that's, those are some typical damages of other species that like if you saw, you might be like, did a deer just eat half my tomato? Like, uh, more likely a groundhog. Um, try to keep an eye out to see if you can see whatever animal it is. Um, most of these animals, rabbits, um, a lot of these are going to be most active in the morning and at dusk, like around sunset, sunrise and sunset. Um, some of them are going to come in the middle of the night and you're just going to be like, <sighs> I'm sorry. That's when you, that's when you try to figure out like um, what their damage looks like. Um, okay, so other things that could be causing problems with your plants are insects, diseases, and nutrient deficiencies. So the top left is some squash beetle damage. Like deers aren't going to leave little holes um, in your plants. Little holes are usually insect damage. Like slug damage looks like this, and slugs will just eat the side off your plant. And a lot of times slugs will be like on the undersides of the leaves. Um, and then there's a, I could have done like interactive stuff for this, but maybe another one. Um, 
So the bottom left is blossom end rot on tomatoes, which is caused by calcium. It's not like deer or nibbling your tomatoes or anything. Um, and then this on the right is uh, a fungal colotrichum. Um, it's known as anthracnose, uh, and that's that's a fungal issue that's not wildlife. Um, so it's good to have an idea of what different things look like uh, to, to really find out what's going on so you know how to properly treat it. Uh, so once you figure out what's going on, uh, that's when you want to garden smarter, um, not harder. And figuring out what's going on is a way of doing that. So some of the things you can do, like once you figure out it's deer, is design your gardens differently, uh, use good plant choice, um, some plants are what people call deer resistant because deer are less likely to go for them and will usually only go for them if like they're starving. Um, like if there's a really bad drought or something or everything's really frozen or there's just a large population of deer. Um, so those, there's some plants that are deer resistant, um, but if deer are hungry enough, they'll, they'll eat anything. Um, like they'll eat just grass, which isn't enough nutrients for them, so that that won't sustain them long. But they'll they'll just try. Um, and you can also use deterrence or scare tactics. And then if all of that fails, you can go for fencing. I say if all of that fails because fencing can be very expensive, as I'm sure you all are aware of. Um, and sometimes some of these other choices will work well. Okay, so design. Um, <laughs> I think of some plants in my head, like when people are just like, oh my gosh, like I can't grow hostas, I can't grow tulips. I'm like, you have deer. Like that's why you can't. That's just, you're planting candy for the deer. They love hostas, they love um, tulips. Uh, so if, you, if you're just like, but I love hostas, I love tulips, I love all this deer candy. <laughs> um, that's okay, that's, it's good to, I like hostas and tulips too, it's okay. Um, but what you wanna do is plant them close to the house. So that way deer um, are less likely to come to the house. So they're less likely to get eaten if they're near your house because deer are scared of people. Um, so if you plant them near your house, they're more protected. And you can also kind of stash your Plants, like if you want to grow hostas, try to put something that deer don't like in front of it. Um, like, uh, I'm trying to think what grows at the same time as hostas. Um, maybe try putting some ferns or something. Deer don't really like ferns or most ferns. So try like doing some ferns in front and then a hosta in the back. Or if you want to have tulips, plant a bunch of daffodils in front of it and then kind of tuck the tulips back. Um, so it's harder for the deer to get to. And then maybe they'll just like see the daffodils or the ferns and be like, this bed's a waste of my time. And then just go on to the next one. Um, so those are some design tips for trying to grow deer candy and deer country. Um, you wanna avoid, like I said, some plants are just deer candy and you wanna try to avoid growing those if you can. Um, General rule of thumb is that deer go for broad, smooth leaved plants. Um, and like, we're, we're both mammals, right? So if I had my choice, personally, I'd probably eat like a deer. Like I wouldn't want to eat any hairy leaved stuff. Like that would just, bleh, the texture wouldn't be nice. I'd go for like nice smooth leaved, like spinach type stuff. So think, you know, think kind of like you would think, I guess. Um, and uh, that's gonna be what they go for. Um, but they'll, they'll eat other stuff too and we eat other stuff that they don't eat. So it's not a strict rule, it's just general rule of thumb. Um, so some plants that fall under my definition of deer candy are hosta, tulips, pansies, lettuce, lilies, um, some native orchids like the pink lady slipper up on the right. Um, and some uh, native orchids are really hard to find now. Uh, they're not growing as well. Um, and there's more that deer will eat. Um, 
So uh, just keep that in mind. Try to do different methods when you're growing them. Um, let's see, oops, I just messed up the way that I had this. Here we go. Okay, um, let's see. Sorry, click, there we go. Okay, and like I said, um, there are some plants that are considered deer resistant, like uh, Rudbeckia herta or any hairy leaved plants. They don't really like those. They don't really like thin grasses. Grasses don't have as high of a nutrient content as they're going for, and I guess they're just unpalatable to deer. Uh, they want like juicy plants. They don't want just like grass. <laughs> um, but if they're starving or like food is scarce, um, they'll eat anything. So just keep that in mind. No plant really deer proof. Um, they're deer resistant because deer typically don't like them. Um, so some good choices for deer resistant plants in sun are daffodils down at the bottom right for spring. Uh, daffodils, they're not real broad leaf, you know, they kind of have those like more narrow leaves and the leaves are a little bit toxic to deer so they won't usually go for those unless they're really having a lot of um, scarcity for food. Um, deer also stay away from usually uh, Baptisia australis uh, or blue false indigo, which I'm thankful for because I love this plant. I think it's so beautiful. Um, it's quick growing, it's a native. Uh, I, I really like it. Uh, Ginny Rosencrans uh, did a presentation where she talked about how the flower heads will turn to seed pods that when you shake them in the fall, they're like little rattles for kids. I, I really love Baptisia. I, I think they're so cute um, and they grow really well here. Uh, swamp milkweed pictured at the bottom and other types of milkweed like common milkweed, butterfly milkweed are really good choices. Um, milkweed is toxic to many animals. That's To me, that's kind of what I think makes the relationship between milkweeds and monarchs like so beautiful because this plant is like so toxic to so many um, animals and insects and everything, but the caterpillars of the monarchs depend on it and that's their food. Um, but deer don't like milkweed. Um, like I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, black-eyed Susans um, are really good choices if you want some blooms for summer and fall. Um, other types of Rudbeckia, it depends. So um, i trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, there's like a couple different species of Rudbeckia that grow here. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head which ones have hairy leaves and which ones have smooth leaves, but the smooth leaves ones, the deer will eat. So if you see like black-eyed Susans, like that's just the common name. So you really want to check the leaves and you want to check the name. And then like ideally, <laughs> like I need to work on memorizing which ones are which. Um, but they don't like the hairy leaved black eyed Susans, but the smooth leaves are fair game for them. So be aware of that. Um, and then New York ironweed, which is another native, which is pictured right here is another good one for deer resistant. The leaves are a little hairy. Um, not sure if it's toxic to them or anything, but they generally stay away from this. And these are beautiful. They just get these pretty purple flowers that are so pretty and they're nice and tall and they can, um, kind of spread over an area. Uh, they, they're very nice. I really like New York ironweed. Um, and then in the previous slide, that grass, let me see if I can go back, Andropogon glomeratus, bushy blue stem, they typically stay away from grasses and sedges and rushes. Um, they're just low nutrient content. So typically ornamental grasses like that are going to be safe to grow in deer country um, and are typically considered deer resistant. But again, can't stress it enough, no plant is truly deer proof. Um, so some shrubs and trees for sun that are deer resistant are the common button bush. Um, they get these pretty little buttons. I think they're just cute as a button, you know. Um, these grow well in a variety of soil conditions. 
uh, the American beauty berry. There's a native type of beauty berry and a non-native type. Of course, I'm going to recommend the native type to you, um, but those are really cool. Uh, birds will eat the berries, um, and they just look pretty. I mean, it's pretty cool to have purple, like bright purple berries in your yard. Um, those are like little shrubs, um, grow to maybe an average like four or five, maybe five foot. Um, Viburnum nudum or possum haw here is another good option for growing. Um, a shrub for deer resistance. Uh, the top is Eastern Bacaris. This grows really well along like the water. Um, and a lot of times you can actually see it growing kind of wild out and about. It's another native. Um, all of these are native actually. Um, and he gets these pretty white flowers and like these pretty like gray green leaves. Um, deer typically stay away from those. Uh, and then Can Canadian which is a really good alternative for like Bradford pear if you want a white flowering spring like small tree. Birds love the berries and I just think they're so pretty. The flowers also smell really sweet unlike the Bradford pear which do not smell good. Um, and they get this nice structure. They're kind of like a small tree large shrub. Um, same with like Viburnum nudum. Um, Honestly, even Eastern Bacaris, it kind of depends like what you consider a tree. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then, okay, so we went over some plants for sun. Now I'm gonna go over some plants for shade. So some plants that are considered deer resistant and shade, like herbaceous perennials here. Wild ginger, um, quick story, uh, a Chesapeake natives um, worked there last summer, they, had some fence that was maybe like this far apart and we have some raised beds um, and a deer got through and we were just like, how is this deer getting through? Like the fence is only this big, that's not big enough for a deer to get through. And one day um, early in the morning, I was the only one there and I was just like, oh my gosh, like I freaked out because I saw a baby deer. It still had its spots and everything. It was just munching on all these plants. I was like, oh. and I tried to get a picture with me too fast, um, but it munched a bunch of other stuff. Um, uh, I can't even remember what it, I can't remember what it ate, but it left this wild ginger alone. Um, they just don't like wild ginger. Um, so deer will literally eat everything else before they eat wild ginger. Um, uh, but another one is Tiarella cordifolia, which I'm really thankful for because I think they're just so cute. They get these pretty little white flowers. Um, they grow really well in shade. They're kind of like a native coral bells almost. Um, like I mentioned, ferns are really good for uh, deer resistance. Um, Deer don't typically like those. So that's a northern maidenhair fern. And this is an ebony spleenwort. Um, and then there's also jack in the pulpit that deer don't really like. I guess the pulpit might emit a bit of a smell that they don't really like. Um, deer also tend to stay away from like mints, like lavender or rosemary. I guess the scent is too overwhelming for them. So they'll typically stay away from those as well. Um, and I thought it was funny, I, a little bit, I don't know. This plant called deer tongue, that's the common name for it. I'm really bad at pronouncing. It's like Canthelium clandestinum. Um, they don't really like that either. It's got like a little bit of hairy uh, parts underneath. They don't really like that. I thought it was funny that something called deer tongue deer don't like, but I guess it's just because it kind of resembles like a deer tongue. Um, they don't like that much either. And then some shrubs and trees for shade that deer don't like are pawpaw, which surprised me because I was like, that's a broad leafed plant. Like it's got, you know, um, or it's a tree with broad leaves and they're smooth, like what? But pawpaw, 
leaves actually have like this natural insecticide in them. And when you crush the leaves, they smell bad. And like I said, like with mint, like deers don't like really smelly plants. So I guess they don't, they usually will go away from pawpaw. And there's actually been studies where there's forests that have a lot of deer browsing. Pawpaw will actually start taking over because all the other trees are getting eaten down and the pawpaws are just flourishing because they're like, the deer don't bother us, um, which I think is great. I, I like the way pawpaws taste. They're the largest native fruit in North America. Um, this is a picture of their fruit. They have like a banana custody flavor. Their flowers don't smell very good though. Um, so be careful planting those in your yard. Like don't plant them too close to your house, I guess. Um, Eastern redbud is another good deer resistant plant. It's a beautiful native uh, spring flowering small tree, um, flowering dogwood, Cornus florida, floridia. Um, it's another good option for deer resistant uh, shrub or small tree. Um, the common persimmon, which is another fruit plant that's native to Maryland, I like. Um, deer don't typically like those. Um, and then the northern spice, spice bush is a little iffy. Most of the time they won't go for it, but if they're hungry enough, they will go for this much sooner than they'll go for something like pawpaw. Um, the spice bush is a great little shrub. I think they're so beautiful. They have like this nice, like kind of arching growth habitat. They spread, they get little berries. Um, the leaves smell spicy too. So again, deer don't like that fragrance. Um, I, I love the way spice bush smells, so yay! Um, and they're also host to the, oh, I can't remember. I think it's, I know what it is, spice, spice bush swallowtail. It's easy to remember because it's that. <laughs> okay, um, so those are some good options for deer resistant plants. There's more lists available online. Um, the extension has a couple good publications on them, but they're long, so I just picked a couple good ones, or my favorites, I guess I'm biased, um, but yeah, so um, and I tried to also include a variety that will grow in different types of soil, um, so yeah, okay, on to deterrence. Sometimes deer are just going to go into your yard, um, so you can try some of the following deterring methods. Um, again, it's best to do this as soon as you notice them so that they don't make your yard like their dinner spot and they don't tell all their friends that it's their dinner spot. Um, I put this picture because the deer is kind of like, what? <laughs> so I thought that would be kind of funny. Um, okay, so your first option for deterrence, um, well, not necessarily first option, just the first option I went over, are different types of sprays. There's all sorts of commercial sprays you can get. Um, I didn't even include a picture of one because there's so many different types. Um, check your local garden centers to see what they have and if they recommend a specific brand. Um, make sure you follow the label on the back of the spray. Um, if you're gonna try to use them around like a vegetable garden, make sure you read to see if it's okay to spray on edible plants. A lot of them aren't. Um, so you really want to make sure you follow all this safety advice, uh, including not using them for edible plants if they're not made for vegetables, and also around children and pets. Um, and these can be kind of difficult because you have to reapply them after every rain, and then they're only good for so long, even if it doesn't rain. Um, some are for taste, some are for smell, some are for both. Um, so there's a lot of different options for these. Um, and wolf urine has usually worked pretty well um, for a smell. Like any predator smells you can put out there will deter deer. Um, but again, you have to reapply after every rain. Um, I don't have a specific brand that I recommend. Check your local garden center. Um, taste. Uh, there are some types of sprays that use like capsaicin um, or other things like strong taste that deer don't like. So those work pretty well, but again, apply after every rain, and then you want to make sure, especially if you're using something for taste, like you don't want to spray something on your squash plants or your beans that's 
like really strong pepper capsaicin and then like hurt yourself. So just please follow directions for those. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, another thing you can do is sensors. So there's like motion activated sensors that can temporarily deter deer. Deer don't like lights, noise, touch, any, all of your, like all of our senses, you can find a way to use those like different, you know, um, sight, smell, taste, all of that. So we went over like taste and smell in the last one. So now it's kind of like lights, noise. Um, and you can use, uh, think about touch too, because some people put like, motion censored sprinklers in their yard for when deer go in their yard. Um, to me, that, um, oh, that seems quite a bit, um, but the lights can work, noise can work. Some people have uh, motion censored like radios, like they connected motion sensors to radios, so radios turn on. It's probably just like static or whatever, but that loud noise will scare the deer. Um, deer get scared pretty easy. They're prey species, so they're always just like, what was that? And they take off running. Um, well, not always immediately take off running. They'll kind of look and then run. Um, since they're prey, they are constantly surveying their surroundings and they will um, get kind of spooked and run, but they also get used to things like if they just see a bunch of light and like, oh my gosh, like it'll scare them the first however many times, but eventually they'll get used to it and it won't bother them anymore. Um, so it's good to kind of change up the methods of scare tactics you use. Um, motion activated is the easiest. So that way you don't have to like sit there with your coffee or whatever. You don't, you don't have to watch. You can get technology to do it for you. Um, uh, this is another cool thing. Let me see if I can play this video real quick. It's real quick. I think it's like 16 seconds. It's called Shishi Odishi. Um, okay. I'll show you what it does. You don't see it more, I am. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Okay, let's see. I don't know why it's not. Okay. Um because I only selected my screen to share PowerPoint. Let's see, let's see. Um, hmm. Okay, well, I guess let's skip that. Um, back to where I was. Okay, so you can see my PowerPoint slide still though, right? Yep, correct. And, okay. and this will, they'll have the link when you um, send your presentation as a worksheet, correct? Yep. Thank you. And you can always YouTube it or Google it too. Um, basically what happens is there's some water that goes into like some sort of pipe. Some people use like PVC. Um, this is a Japanese uh, originated type of fountain. Um, the Shishi Odishi, which I'm probably saying wrong, I'm sorry. It actually roughly translates to like deer scarer. So they used to use this in rice fields to deter deer and scare them because like it's the sound, the deer just like, what is that? Um, but they, they look kind of nice. There's lots of good pictures of them online. Um, this is one that's at a, a Buddhist temple in Kyoto, Japan. Um, but it's like the water runs into this pipe that is put at like an angle so that center of gravity is kind of off so it's at one you know it's down on one side up on the other but then the water drips down eventually the center of gravity is shifted so that it goes like this and then it like bangs back on and there's usually rocks at the bottom and then that like noise um but it's louder than that. If the, if the video we're working, I should have shared screen instead of presentation, sorry. Um, you can hear that it, it just makes a loud noise. It's not like really loud. Like some people actually, people actually can find the sound soothing. There's like videos online just of that sound for like 10 hours. Um, but so we like this. We, we humans think it's visually appealing. The sound is soothing. Um, I guess that's really subjective. Some people might not. Um, but some people do, uh, but this can scare deer. It's 
translates to deer scarer, but they can get used to this. So it's best to use this in conjunction with other methods. Um, but it's something pretty if you want to try something pretty uh, cool. Um, you can also use reflective devices to scare deer. Like that's the whole sight thing. They'll see it and be like, what was that? And then they'll be like, I don't know what it is. And they'll just run <laughs> away. But then eventually they'll realize, I don't care about that ribbon. It's not going to hurt me. I'm going to keep eating these beans. Um, so you can use like reflective tape, shiny ribbons. This is a picture of something from DNR. Uh, they just have like a stake with some shiny ribbons. And you can put that kind of like around the perimeter of your property. Or like if there's like a hill at the end of your property that's on like a wood line and the deers come up there, you can try putting them there. So the deer get scared before they even get onto your property or your vegetable garden or wherever you're trying to deter deer from. Um, you can use like fishing line and old CDs and DVDs uh, or pie tins or tin cans. Um, and if you put those close enough together, not only will the reflection and the movement that is caused by the wind moving these things scare the deer, that noise that they'll make by clapping together will also scare the deer. So that kind of doubles as visual and uh, sound deterrent. Um, and again, uh, you want to place those around the per perimeter and entry points. Um, and some people have tried using just fishing line. Um, like putting it like 18 feet off so that the deer will walk and then they'll touch it and they'll be like, oh my gosh, what was that? Um, and that can work a little bit, but eventually the deer will just jump over that. So that's a case again, where it's good to mix up your methods, alternate methods, try a bunch of different ones, as many as you can at once. Um, so, okay, here. So dogs, I don't recommend letting your dogs just chase deer. Deer can be they're prey, but they have strong feet. Um, studies have shown that um, like in orchard, orchard, orchards where it's like, like 30 acres-ish or less, maybe a little bit more, um, if someone installs like an electric fence and then has kind of like orchard guard dogs, um, the dogs being there and like chasing the deer away have helped plant growth um, and you know maybe they're like big strong dogs and if it's a couple of them deer I don't know I don't know um, but dogs have been proven to help deer can get used to dogs um, like if I were to suggest the dog thing I would say just let your dog bark at them because that's sound I don't recommend like, oh, go, go get them, girl. Um, per, I am just too afraid of a dog getting hurt um, for that. Um, so like my dogs have barked, like my dogs have barked at groundhogs. They've barked at deer. And I like for the groundhogs, I was kind of like, okay, you can bark because I don't know what else to do. And that actually got the groundhog away. My dog just barking um, and then going a little bit. And I said, hey, come back here. Like immediately, I was like, you are not going after <laughs> Groundhogs have teeth, okay? Um, they can hurt dogs. Um, so I don't like the whole, like getting your dog to go after. But if your dog barks, which a lot of dogs do, um, this is enough to help deter and it's a sound and that's also like a predator sound so like I said like for sprays like predator sprays work predator sounds also work um but you don't want to um let anything happen to your dog so just be very careful really the best thing is just barking um but deer can again they'll get used to the dog and be like that dog is is all bark no bite I'm not worried about that dog um so just let the dog bark, uh, that'll scare the deer, but then don't use dogs as a sole method. Um, it's really, again, just the barking. And if your dog chases deer, they can get attacked by, the deer can turn back on them. Um, and they can also, like, what if your dog chases the deer into the woods or something? Um, so your dog can get lost. So if, like, make sure your dog has really, really good recall skills. Like, hey, get back here. And if they're not the type of dog to immediately turn around, um, don't, please don't even try it. Um, 
So very, very close supervision for that method and really should not be the sole method. Um, and also, um, if you have dogs and you have deer, make sure you give your dogs distemper vaccine and also treat them for uh, deers and ticks. I, ticks and fleas. Um, oops. Um, so the, the doggy distemper vaccine is the like little acronym for that is DHLLP. And the L stands for leptospiriasis, which is more common than you probably think it is. And it, it can be scary like dogs. Like a lot of times when dogs have this, people are like, oh my gosh, my dog has rabies because they're so uncoordinated and just acting weird. Most of the time it's lepto, um, which can be deadly. It can cause liver and kidney failure. But dogs get this by um, like drinking puddles, usually that kind of like deer peed in. Um, and lepto is one of those uncommon diseases that is actually spread between dogs and animals and people. So you really want to make sure if you have deer around your property um, to give your dog distemper. You should give your dog distemper anyway because those DHL PPs are nasty. Don't You don't want to deal with those. Um, so make sure to cover, protect your dog and then, you know, the whole deer tick thing and Lyme disease. So, uh, flea and tick treatment. Um, and again, so when it comes to turn deer, you want to alternate methods. Like if, if you can do good design um, and plant deer resistant plants and use a variety of methods, um, that is going to be the best way to really deter them. Um, so uh, they're, they're quick learners. Um, They'll, they'll learn these things are all bark, no bite, <laughs> and won't hurt them, so they'll get used to it. And if they're hungry enough, deer have been known to push through even electrical fences if they're hungry enough. Um, I try to think like, well, if a human were starving, like, what would they do? Um, so deer uh, don't have the societal structure we do, um, so they will push a little bit harder. Um, okay, so... You can also try, this isn't a deterrent, this is kind of more of a design sort of component. You can try planting a nurse crop. So um, in places where you have a lot of deer damage, um, you can try, like if you have like some prized tulips that you wanna grow, I would recommend try growing them near your house and then plant I mean, the nurse crop thing can kind of backfire though. Like if you plant basically a crop of some plants that you know deer love far away from what you're really trying to grow that you know deer love, that kind of keeps them over there. But then you're feeding deer <laughs> and how close they are, you might just be attracting them more. So this can easily backfire. It's, it's interesting though. Um, the potential option. Um, so that's one thing to consider. You can also try micro exclusion. So uh, you can try just covering the plants that you know deer will go for, like vegetables. Uh, you can try floating row covers. Um, and this will prevent most wildlife from getting to whatever you're trying to grow. Floating row covers are great. They can also add just a little bit of heat. Um, so they're really good for vegetables and fruit. Um, you can try like cages around like prized plants that you know deer will love. Or if you have a lot of deer in one area, but not a lot, and you have this like really big well-established plant and it looks great there, you can try a cage. Um, or like a plastic netting, uh, but uh, it's not always the most attractive. So um, that's something to consider. That's one downside, they're not visually attractive. Um, and then you can also try, like if you have a vegetable garden or like a blueberry patch or what have you, um, you can try just fencing off that area 
um, like that whole area. And there's different methods of fencing you can use. Like you can use a slant so that the deer, like it's so much space in between them that the deer can't jump over it. Um, to me, looking at this, I feel like the deer would get over it. Um, but um, yeah, and there's different, what you can also do, um, instead of like the slant method, you can space fencing out a little bit. So uh, it's like you have the fence, like the plants are here, you have one fence here, and then you have another fence, um, like a certain amount of way so that the plants, the deer can't jump over all of that. Um, those are some methods you can use. Um, let's see. Uh, and then if all of that fails, you can go for the most expensive option, which is tall fencing. You want to try to go eight foot. And if the deer haven't put your yard on the map, you can try six foot because six foot is not tall enough to deter deer if they know that you have candy for them in your yard. They will jump that. <laughs> um, it might be harder for them to jump a six foot, but they'll do it. So if you put a six foot up like as soon as you plant, whatever you're planting and they don't know that your yard is there, that works. Um, but if they already know that you have these delicious hostas, it's best to plant, uh, put an eight foot fence. Um, there's different ways you can do it. I wouldn't recommend, um, trying to think, like, like pole fencing like this. Cause like I said, baby deer can get through it. Um, and they'll still eat your plants. Um, and so you just want to make sure it's, it's deer proof, basically a deer secure fence, eight foot tall, no gaps wide enough they can get in. Also make sure it goes down to the ground because they can and will go under fencing. Um, and eight foot is usually too tall for them to jump over. Um, and uh, that's kind of a last resort. The best thing to do if you're having deer issues is kind of notice the pattern. Um, I think what's recommended is notice the pattern over five years if you can, um, but that might be a little bit long, um, but kind of like maybe five years for a fence might be good because um, you might notice seasonal patterns and all sorts of things. And maybe deer were bad one year because there was really bad drought and they won't be bad the next year. So you don't need to spend all the money on the fence. Um, so just kind of like keep an eye out and ultimately you decide whatever is important to you and uh, whatever methods you want to do. Um, tall fencing is going to make your yard a fortress. Uh, sprays will work until it rains. Um, deer resistant plants work until there's a drought um, and all those sorts of things. But if, um, if they've already developed their own Garden Smarter series and they're just like, hey, this is the best garden to go to. This is the best method to get beyond that four foot fence. Um, just take a wildlife photography. Like, look how cute this deer is. The bird's all on its nose. It's so cute. Um, you can just kind of enjoy the deer. Uh, uh, but thank you. That's that's all I have for today. Um, uh, like uh, Lisa said, the next Garden Smarter is next Saturday. We have a bunch coming up. Um, so please attend if you can. Uh, and there's more resources available online. The University of Maryland Extension has a bunch of um, different publications. We have the Home Garden Information Center. You can always submit questions, ask a master gardener, uh, ask the expert. The Maryland Grows blog has different blog posts. They have some about deers and everything and keep checking your local programming. Uh, there's going to be more Garden Smarters at the Calvert Library virtually throughout 2021. Uh, Garden Smarters is a great local program and the handbook um, is brought to you by Calvert and here's two pages of references. Okay, so on to questions. Okay, that was great. Thank you, um, Mariah. Let me put my video so people can see me. Um, okay, so I've been writing everybody's um, questions and notes, um, and then we'll go on and I will um, cancel the recording if anybody 
wants to um, unmute themselves. But here are some of the comments. Um, someone said that they actually use lavender um, around their hostas to keep um, deer away. Um, do you know of any other um, herbs to interplant um, to deer? Or do you think most of the time, because um, herbs are all about the senses and the taste and the flavor that they really do not go after herbs? Yeah, um, yep, so lavender is great. Anything real minty. Um, sage is also really good. Sage, you get the double whammy, I guess, um, of the leaves are hairy and it smells. Um, rosemary can work. Um, a lot of mints, really. Um, so yeah, all of those, all of those will work. Okay, and then someone was asking if deer avoid a certain color because they were just curious because they are keeping an eye on a native orchid that is orange color. So they're hoping to see it in the spring. So they were wondering if there was a color um, that deer do not go after. You know, I'm honestly unsure. Um, if I remember correctly, I don't know if I remember correctly. I thought, I really if you don't know, well, maybe if you um, come with the answer, um, I'm going to CC you out with um, the e email and you can always email us back with the answer once you have it. Yeah, um, well, I found, I read something a while ago, so I just like quickly searched it because I was like, wait, I read that they kind of see similar to a colorblind human, but they can okay. see like blues and purples. Um, so they, they don't really see uh, like the reds and greens, but um, they can still kind of see that. But okay. I would recommend if you have an orchid that you're trying to make sure a deer don't get is that's when you do the micro exclusion and just put like a little cage around it. Um, mm -hmm just like two by two, like chicken wire or something. Um, just kind of make a little cage to protect the orchid. That Because the orchid, depending on what type it is, might have like nice leaves that they like. So that would be my recommendation. I'm not sure if they really don't go for one color or um, if they do go for one color over the other. They do have different uh, visuals than we do. Um, but I don't currently have the answer. But my suggestion would be to use like a little cage around it. Okay, and just in case someone um, is ready to leave, um, there is a comment about the next Garner Smarter session. So the next Garner Smarter session is on February 13th at 1 p.m. and we are going to be talking about growing um, three crops and that will be it. And, and you can always um, see our schedule either through the Calvert Library um, event page or visit our Facebook. Okay, um, someone was also asking about Jerusalem artichokes um, and said that they have hairy leaves. So are they less likely to go after that as well? Um, I'm not 100% sure if they really like Jerusalem artichokes. Um, general rule of thumb would say no, but sometimes um, they'll go for things that they don't normally go for. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then have you heard of a dogwood disease, the dogwood cornois floridus, and do you know anything about that? I have a feeling I know what it is, but I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. Um, if it's what I'm thinking of, it doesn't has something to do with the non-native variety. Um, okay. I have it off the top of my head. Um, okay, and we can always um, email everybody that if either you or I um, find out, and I know Edward's on here too, so maybe one of us three will find that information as well. Um, okay, and then someone commented that they um, heard or seen that deer don't like rocky and um, stone steps. So that's another way to um, prevent deer. And then someone was asking about feeding um, deer corn. They were wondering if that's harmful. 
Um, well, deer will eat corn. Um, some people would consider that kind of baiting, which is illegal if you're like putting piles of corn to like, mm -hmm. if you're a hunter, that mm -hmm. um, is a no-no. Um, will eat corn. I'm not sure how harmful it is to them. Um, but it, it's part of their diet, so um, that's that's all I got for that. <laughs> okay, so you don't really know. And then um, someone commented about melogoranate, which is a high level of metal, and wanted to confirm that it's harmful um, for food crops, so you really shouldn't do that for, like, food crop determinant um, to deter the deer. Is that correct? What, what is it called again? It's M-E-L-O-R-G-A-N-I-T-E. Apparently, it's um, high in metal. I haven't heard of it, to be honest. Yeah, I haven't either. So, okay, um, but Most likely, my suggestion is if it's high on metal, I would not use it. <laughs> I agree. Um, and then someone also commented when you were talking about using dogs to um, get deer away. Um, they also have heard reports of um, them causing accidents um, in places that are really close to the road. So I agree with that. And then another person had a good suggestion, which is basically a green fence. So using berries and um, tall hedges um, to protect your vegetable garden. So um, using plants for a natural fencing. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes. So those were all of the um, questions. I'm going to um, stop recording so that if anybody wants to ask a question, they can unmute themselves. So thank you, everybody. You can stay um, put and ask your questions if you have anything else. Thank you.